Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Wherever you are, whenever you may be listening, this is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, season number two, episode number three. And I am your host, the man with the face made for radio and the voice made for print, Casey Trowbridge, and I am so happy to be with you. We have a lot to talk about on this week's episode of Talking Audiobooks. The 2017 Audis were held on June 1st in New York as sort of a conjunction event with the Audio Publishers Association Conference. And I did watch the live stream on the YouTube uh, app on my Apple TV. The link was provided by Audible. And so I did watch the ceremony. And I do have some things to say about it. We're not going to run down all the winners in all the categories. We will have that information available in the show notes. But we are going to talk about the five biggest categories, and I'm going to give some of my general thoughts on the ceremony in just a moment. We also have a What Caught My Ear title for the week, fan feedback question, PDQ release of the week, and an audio bingo update. We'll talk about my audio bingo progress. If you heard the show last week, uh, you've heard the promo for audio bingo so we have all of that and who knows what other rabbit trails we might wander down as we uh, get through all of this but um, I want to start out by saying that I'm recording this on June the 3rd and so the London Bridge attack has uh, just happened things are unfolding and it looks like this was Uh, It's being considered right now an act of terrorism, and of course that has a conventional meaning, but if you really break down and consider uh, what that means, an act of terrorism is simply anything that uh, strikes fear or terror in the hearts and minds of a large number of people, and that certainly is the case here. Of course, you know, this show is about audiobooks, and in the grand scheme of things, Uh, That's less important than lives being lost and uh, people being injured and, and, you know, people being affected by this tragedy. We do want to get back to the subject at hand, but, uh, you know, you're hearing this on June 9th, so it is is a few days old, but it's still going to be fresh in, in our minds. And so I do want to take a moment just to... Uh, extend my thoughts, prayers, and well wishes to everyone that has been affected and impacted by this unfolding situation that, as I said, is is very current as I am recording this. It'll be a few days older by the time you hear it, of course, but, uh, you know, something that shouldn't soon be forgotten, regardless of how it came to be. But we do have to move on. This is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, after all. And so we do need to get back to the subject at hand. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get into the main thrust of the show, a recap of the Audis. Um, It is June. It's June 9th when you listen to this. But I could have mentioned this on last week's show, but... When I had recorded, it hadn't happened yet, and I hadn't actually gotten the chance to really look until after the show was published anyway, so it's, you know, it's only appropriate that I mention it this week. But since this is a June-long thing, it's, you still have plenty of time to, to take part in this, and, you know, it, it's a, it's a thing that happens every month. Um, Amazon put, their June monthly Kindle deals up on June 1st, as you would do if you were going to do that once a month. You would start at the 1st. But um, I hadn't looked, like I said, until after the show was published to see what they were. And you say, well, that's Kindle books. This is a show about audiobooks. And I say to you, I know that. 
But the point is that, as I discussed on the December 16th episode of Talking Audiobooks, back when that other guy was hosting, you know, the hack that now produces this show. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain! The monthly Kindle deals are a good place to look for bargains because of the whisper sync for voice feature where you can sync the audio book up with the Kindle book and switch back and forth between the two without losing your place. And if you buy the Kindle book first, you can often get the audio book at a discount. And so when you look at the monthly Kindle deals, there's a section where you can sort them by like genre and different things uh, that you might find it useful to sort by. And one of them is you can sort out all the books that are ebooks with audible narration, and that is the WhisperSync titles. And so I do that, and then I go through the genres and I see which WhisperSync titles might be available that I like and that I might want to purchase because the cost of the Kindle book as a monthly deal and the cost of the audiobook add on is still going to be lower in most cases than the cost of a audible credit even on the best possible plan and i actually found two this month that i'm going to purchase Uh, one is called 42 faith the rest of the jackie robinson story by ed henry narrated by the author i'm a big jackie robinson fan i wrote several term papers about jackie robinson when i was in school none of them were any good because i was not a good term paper writer but he was someone who fascinated me and someone who i really admired not just because he was a baseball player or even the first african-american to play in the major leagues on a on a permanent basis there there were a few guys that tried to sneak in or were snuck in for a time before that but they were always summarily dismissed but you know that's a story for a baseball podcast that that kindle book right now for this month is on sale for three dollars and 99 cents and i can add the audio version for another $3.99 and uh, you add sales tax to all of that and you get your total and it's like $8.50 in South Dakota but uh, still less than the cost of a credit. The other one is uh, called Kicking and Dreaming the Story of Heart, Soul and Rock and Roll and that is by Ann and Nancy Wilson narrated by the authors and of course they are the sisters behind the group heart and i would say that i am a fan of heart i'm not a devotee necessarily i like some of their music but i'm not super hardcore into them but i think they have an interesting story and so that's another book that i want to check out that kindle book is $1.99 plus tax and adding the audiobook is another $3.99 plus tax. So, you know, I think I think the total would be like $7.37 for me. If you're in one of those states where you don't have to pay uh, sales tax on internet purchases, which South Dakota was until like February of this year, Amazon finally started charging us uh, sales tax on most everything. Then you get it for the exact price that that I just said, $1.99 plus $3.99. So those are really the two books that I found this month. But again, I wanted to mention that because you have the month of June to browse through those titles and see what you can come up with. And again, if it's if it's less than the cost of a credit and sometimes by a very significant amount, um, you might do well to consider just dropping the cash and saving your credits for something else if you're an Audible member. And you don't even need to be a an active member of Audible to get the uh, WhisperSync titles at that discount. You just need to add them to your cart when you buy the Kindle version. you got to buy the Kindle version first. There's a, a checkbox 
it says add audible narration for three dollars and ninety nine cents or whatever so you don't need to be a a member to do that an audible member to do that but if you are like i said you do well to consider saving your credits on something else and browsing the kindle book list just to see you don't even have to have like the kindle app or or anything installed i buy kindle books add the audible narration and then never open the kindle books on anything it's just a way to get the audible at a, at a discount because it's still worthwhile you know, for me even though you know my average cost of credit since i'm on the biggest audible membership plan the i'm on the the audible platinum yearly plan which is 24 credits all at once for two, 229 dollars and 50 cents plus tax so my average cost per credit is ten dollars and 18 cents including uh, tax so those two prices i gave you 850 and 737 are lower than the uh, cost of one of my credits so it's worth it to me to consider getting them that way and so that's probably what i'm going to end up doing but if you are not an audible member and haven't been one or you know haven't been one for a very long time you might be eligible for our audible free trial and to tell you about our audible free trial and how you can get a free book which you can use to listen to uh, any number of titles that we're going to discuss as being 2017 Audi winners. Uh, I'm going to throw it to Ken, and he's going to tell you all about the way that you can get a free trial of Audible just by listening to this podcast. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. And thank you, Ken. And we are now back to discuss the 2017 Audis as promised. It was hosted by Paula Poundstone, uh, the comedian and uh, she's all over different things. You've probably heard her on NPR. Uh, I believe, you know, just she's everywhere. She's written books and has narrated her own audiobooks. And she hosted the 2016 Audis, and they liked her performance so much they brought her back for 2017. And I thought she did a fine job as host. She's one of those people, I've been a fan of hers for longer than I'd care to admit because. Uh, it would show my age, but I remember watching some of her stand-up when I was in high school, and she has um, a tendency to, she doesn't just stand up and tell jokes per se, she likes to interact with the audience, and talk to the audience, and sort of play off of them, and quip off of their responses, and so it's kind of a more interactive um, show that she does. And she did that a lot in the Audi Awards ceremony as well. The thing is, you know, she would ask someone in the audience a question and you wouldn't necessarily know who because they wouldn't say, or even if they did say, the audience wasn't miked. So you couldn't actually hear the answers that were given to the questions that she would ask. And so it was kind of a bit of a distraction. Like you felt like you were kind of missing out. Uh, you were only hearing one side of a conversation. But in general, she made up for it by repeating the, the answers that were given. She could have probably done that a little bit more, but it, it did kind of help to include the the people uh, watching on the live stream in the experience, at least to a little bit of a degree. Now I have to say before I get too far more into this that I'm not really a big awards show person. I don't watch the Oscars, I don't watch the Emmys, the Grammys, the Tonys. I'd rather be punched in the face repeatedly than watch even a minute of the ESPY awards, which are ESPN's ratings grab. 
I don't want to rant on that. That's a rant for a different day. If I ever uh, review Those Guys Have All the Fun by James Andrew Miller on this podcast, I can rant about how dumb the SP Awards are. But I really don't like award shows in general, and, and they just don't really appeal to me on any level for the most part. And, you know, if they appeal to you, that's great. And I'm certainly not going to begrudge anyone that because, um, like I said, I have a friend that she watches all the music award shows and there are tons of them. And I always know when they are because she always posts her commentary or her reviews or her thoughts on Facebook. And I don't have a problem reading those things. Uh, It's just not something that appeals to me. But like I said, if it's your cup of tea, that's cool. You know, there's there's a reason they make chocolate ice cream and vanilla ice cream uh, to appeal to people who like good ice cream and people who like vanilla ice cream. No, I, I'm just kidding. But you get the idea, at least. So I'm not much of an award show guy, like I said twice already. But the Audis are a little bit different. And I find them to be more enjoyable for a couple different reasons. Number one, this ceremony lasted like two hours in total. It was a more intimate ceremony than your big shows would be your Oscars and your Emmys and stuff. This is a lot more intimate and because it's not being televised, there's no commercials. And so they were able to breeze through things quickly. And what they would do if you didn't watch is they would bring out a couple of presenters to run down a few different categories. They would do like three or four categories each. Each group would do like three or four categories and then There'd be a little bit with Paula and then new presenters would come out and do three or four more categories. And they got through 27 categories in two hours. There are actually 30 Audis given, but the Audi Awards for uh, Excellence in Design, Marketing and Production were handed out the day before and they were just recapped here at the ceremony. You know, they brought out these different presenters to do different categories. And one of them was the audiobook blogger of the year. And it's a young lady named Felicia. And I believe her Twitter handle is the geeky blogger. And I apologize if that's wrong, but I don't think it is. Anyway, I had the occasion to chit chat with her yesterday, which would be the day after the ceremony. I reached out and I asked her if she would be interested in coming on the show and talking about her experience this week and just being the audiobook blogger of the year. How does one uh, get to be the audiobook blogger of the year and things like that? And she has agreed, so we're going to get that interview scheduled very soon and she will come on the show and I will be very happy to have her here to discuss that. And she was up with uh, someone presenting some awards and got to take part in the ceremony i thought that was pretty cool and i think they should extend that a little bit further i'm thinking next year it should be the audiobook podcaster of the year Uh, not that i have any names in mind right now but if you talk to me in six months i may be able to think of at least one person that that they should consider and knowing his schedule like i do he'll probably be free next year when they're ready to do the 2018 Audi Awards. Now, I said that I don't like award shows, that's the fourth time. So I don't really always pay close attention to when awards are announced or when nominees are announced, but I do pay attention to when the Audi nominees are announced. And I'm glad I do because this year at least, I found a couple books that I was interested in reading that had somehow escaped my notice when uh, just randomly checking the coming soon section of Audible or whatever. I found a couple and one of them actually won the Audi in uh, business and personal development. Uh, it's um, The book is titled uh, Humans Need Not Apply by Jerry Kaplan narrated by John Pruden for Tantor Audio. It's about artificial intelligence and robotics and things like that. And those are subjects that appeal to me and I'm still kind of scratching my head as to how I could have possibly have missed this book because it's a subject that I am interested in. 
and I'm a big fan of John Pruden as a narrator. I listened to him narrate American Sniper and a couple other books last year, and I'm really a fan of his, and I think he does a pretty good job. I'm happy for that book to win the Audi. So when it was announced as being a nominee, it ended up on my uh, to be listen list. It's still there, even though it is now one, but it is one that I'm going to check out. And that that's one that stood out to me. Uh, there were a couple of other books that I had read that were nominated. I think I accounted like when all the nominees were announced across 27 categories, I think there were like maybe nine or 10 books that I had read or wanted to read that actually were nominated for something. A couple of them uh, won, you know, a couple of them didn't win, obviously, but, you know, it's one of those things where, like, for movies, I don't know how many times I see a Best Picture nominee, but for audiobooks, you know, I'm at least familiar with the titles, even if I've not read a lot of them or don't really have any interest. The fact that I've at least heard of them helps. And so, uh, you know, there was a couple other ones. Uh, James Patterson won for Cross Justice in the thriller category. And there was a couple other books nominated in that category that I was familiar with. One of the ones that I was very happy to see win was um, in the science fiction category, uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens by Alan Dean Foster, narrated by Mark Thompson from Penguin Random House Audio won the best science fiction Audi and I was pulling for that to win because I'm a big fan of Mark Thompson's narration as you probably know if you've listened to our book commentary on Thrawn. Uh, I've extended an invitation to Mark to come on the show and to talk about his career and his uh, Audi win and The Force Awakens and so hopefully we can uh, get that scheduled as well. So I was very happy to see that The Force Awakens won. It was it was so cool because I wasn't confident that it was going to win. I hoped it won, but I was thinking, man, stuff I like never seems to win. And I was also sort of thinking that like Star Wars would have the same problem in audiobook that it, that it has in movies. Like it, it, its popularity would hurt it in a, in a weird way, but. You know, it wasn't really like that, and it, it won, and I was very happy about that. And one of the things that makes the Audis go by a little bit quicker is the fact that they do the awards in bunches, but nobody gives acceptance speeches until the very last three awards are handed out. Female Narrator of the Year, Male Narrator of the Year, and Audiobook of the Year. Those are the only uh, awards that got speeches. Like I said, it just made for a pretty quick and and tight experience and uh, there were some good laughs provided by Paula and there were some good moments that we're gonna talk about when we get to the three speeches that were given, one of which was arguably the highlight of the night. I say arguably, I don't know what you could argue for, but I suppose you could argue for something else, but we'll talk about that when we, when we get to it on the schedule here. So those are kind of my overall thoughts about the ceremony. And like I said earlier, it was a lot of fun to tweet back and forth with people, talk about the winners and make observations about the show that was unfolding before us. It's not gonna make me wanna watch the Oscars or anything like that and try that to see if I can replicate the experience. But it was a, it was a lot of fun and I was able to promote the show a little bit. And so all around, it was a win-win for for us, I think, and certainly for me, I had a good time and ended up getting my own Audi out of it, at least one in the family, and that's, you know, a good enough experience for me. So before we get into the big five categories and sort of break them down a little bit further, uh, let's go and listen to uh, Ken again. We'll let him talk again. And he's going to tell us about this week's PDQ release of the week. And we'll be back right after this from Ken. Thanks, Casey. 
Hey, listeners, if you haven't yet gotten Dad something for Father's Day, here's a great idea from PDQ Audiobooks. It's the New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes 60-episode set. That's right. The world-famous sleuth is back in this astounding 60-episode collection, direct from the original audio broadcasts. Featuring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, this collection contains nearly 30 hours of old-time radio broadcasting at its best. Digitally remastered from the original broadcast recordings, this amazing set is a true collector's item for Sherlock Holmes fans everywhere. Take a listen. That's Rewind brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Well, I'm sure Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him, shall we? Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Quiet, Willie. Quiet, Monsieur. Lie down. Dogs seem very pleased with themselves tonight. Did they have a good day? Yes, the three of us did, my boy. Uh, go on. Run off, run off out in the patio. I took a seven iron and some old golf balls on the beach this afternoon. I improved my game, I think, and the dogs had a great time chasing the golf balls. On the way home, the little rascals had a furious battle with an elderly pelican. <laughs> so their day was complete. <laughs> I'll have to join you on one of your afternoon strolls, Doctor. You and the dog seem to have so much fun. Oh, I'll be glad of your company, Mr. Bartell. Well, drop your usual chair and I'll get on with tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure. From the hint you gave us last week, I guess a Frenchman played a prominent part in the story. Yes, indeed he did, Mr. Bartell. His name was Francois Lavia. And he was a detective of some note in his own country. At the time my story begins, it was in 1889, to be exact, Lavia had come over to London to discuss with Holmes the difficulties of translating some of his monographs into the French language. At this particular time, I was in the early days of my marriage, Mr. Bartell, and this fact, combined with a busy practice, meant that I saw very little of my old friend. He must have missed you, Doctor. Oh, uh, he did. Uh, well, of course, he'd never admit the fact, but, uh, but uh, to get on with my story... One cloudless June afternoon, I found myself in the neighborhood of Baker Street, and I couldn't resist paying a visit to Holmes. Mrs. Hudson was out, but uh, having retained my old latch key, I let myself in and mounted the familiar stairs. It gave me a strange feeling as I raised my hand to knock on what once had been my own living room door. Come in, come in. Oh, hello, Holmes. Yeah, Holmes. Oh, I, I, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you... Watson, my dear fellow. How very nice to see you again. <laughs> it's great to see you, Holmes. I, I'm sorry I interrupted you. I, no. I didn't know that you had company. Not at all, my dear fellow. We're delighted. Aren't we, Le Villard? Yes, what we? This is, uh, Monsieur Le Villard. Well, uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Enchanté, monsieur. I have often wished to meet the so charming Dr. Watson. Holmes has told me a great deal about you. Oh, it's very nice of you, sir. Ah, that is. Suits you, Watson. You're a splendid old fellow. Gained a little weight, haven't you? Oh, uh, yes, a few pounds, I mean. Come, sir, sit down, won't you? Uh, you sure that I'm not interrupting you in some important discussion? Oh, no, oh, no, 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 my cher doctor. We were having a good-natured argument on the relative abilities of the French criminal compared to the English. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you must lend me your support, idea. Watson. Monsieur Le VI is convinced that the English criminal is a very dull dog indeed. Well, we've met some far from dull ones in our time, I... I assure you, Monsieur Le Villard. Ah, the exceptions <laughs> rather than the rule, I fear, Monsieur Doctor. Uh, you're stubborn, aren't you, Le Villard? <laughs> Believe me, my dear friend, that I will yield to no one in my admiration of your knowledge and skill. That is why I wish I could persuade you to practice in Paris. Ah, there you would find opponents really worthy of your steel. What can happen to interest you in this land of gray frogs, uh, boiled potatoes, and uh, pots of tea? Excuse me for myself, sir. You're, you're not very flattering. Oh, don't be so insular, Watson. Oh, I admit no offense, my friend. Well, you say that the English criminal is dull. Well, perhaps if you were to read a published story of mine called A, a Study in Scarlet, you'd think differently. 
It tells of a very exciting adventure that Holmes and I had. I have read it, my friend. Oh, you have? An extremely gripping story, but mm-hmm. surely you will admit that the crime was essentially of American origin. <laughs> He's right, Watson. <laughs> He's perfectly right, dear me. What can I do to vindicate the dishonor of the London criminal? Let me see. Oh, yes, yes, of course. A copy of today's Times. That's fine. I shall introduce you to a section known as the Agony Column. Huh? Uh, where is it now? Oh, yes, here we are. This should convince you of the color and variety of English life. The agony column? Mm-hmm. It sounds most painful. Uh, what is it, please? A personal column is liable to contain anything from a lover's frantic appeal to his lady love to a ransom note. Challenge Dad to see if he can figure out who done it before Sherlock does. Check the show notes for the link to this title or just go to Audible and search PDQ Audiobooks Sherlock. Your dad will be glad you did. Back to you, Casey. Thanks, Ken, for telling us about that PDQ release. And now, uh, I keep saying we're going to get to our main five categories, but before we do that, uh, I want to bring out this week's fan feedback question of the week. And this week's question is, what did you think of the Audis? Did you watch the live stream? Did you follow the ceremony on Twitter or Facebook? Did you participate in the armchair Audis campaign that was going around where people tried to listen to the nominees and make their own selections? Do you even know what the Audis are beyond what I've already said? Like... You know, this podcast appeals to hardcore audiobook listeners, but also more casual listeners. So do you know what the Audis are beyond what I've already said about them? Uh, This is the 22nd year they've been given out, by the way. You know, they're not exactly a new phenomenon. And we're going to put a link to the Audi results through the years in the show notes as well. And if you go back and look at what the Audis were like in 1996 and what they're like now, you can definitely see how the industry has sort of evolved since the first time the Audis were given out until now. But, you know, we also appeal to the casual listener, and maybe you don't know what an Audi is. Maybe the extent of your knowledge of them before listening to this show was seeing that a book was nominated for an Audi in a publisher's summary on like an audible.com because when a book is nominated for an Audi or wins one uh, that usually gets added to the publisher's summary on different book retailers and stuff so maybe that's all you've known does it really matter to you is your to be listen list bigger now because the Audis have been given out and you have decided that you want to listen to some of these books specifically because they won Audis. Like I said, I don't I don't base my listening lists on whether or not a book gets nominated for an Audi or not, but um, through happenstance this year at least, I did find one or two titles, as I mentioned earlier, that I wanted to read and that I would have read anyway had I known about them. They just slipped through the cracks, but once I saw them on the nomination list for an Audi, I made it a point to add them to my to my list. So, are you like me? Do you just pick your books based on what you like, and it doesn't really matter if they're up for something? Or do you give some weight to the Audi Awards and uh, the nominees and, the, and who wins? Does that help you prioritize them or any way, or does that add books to your wish list and i want to remind you since we're talking about the feedback question that um through the month of june anyone who sends feedback on our question of the week or tells us what they like about the show or what they don't like about the show uh, or proposes a topic suggestion or um, show idea or a question that they would like fellow audiobook listeners to answer uh, through me asking it here in the fan feedback section 
Um, anyone who emails feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com from now through the end of June, June 30th, will be entered into a giveaway. We're going to give away six Audible credits through a random drawing at the end of the month. And so answering the question about the Audis or giving your own feedback on ceremony, what would you change if you had changed something? What would it be? Uh, do you think there's categories missing? I happen to think that they could do the categories slightly different and include a few more genres. I think science. It was broken out as its own category a few years ago, and then it kind of got folded into other categories. And I, I kind of think that science should be allowed to stand on its own. And it, maybe it's just because I'm a sports fan. I think sports could probably uh, merit its own category as well. I think there are a lot of good sports titles that end up having to compete as biographies or maybe they get thrown into history. Um, and, I, and I think that particularly if someone writes a book about a sports team or about the history of a specific event, you know, that kind of gets thrown into history and that's just a really broad category and could sort of be pared down. I would be in favor of a couple more audio, uh, audi categories, excuse me, and I would say that maybe science and sports would be two of them. And adding them wouldn't necessarily extend the show all that much because, it, like I said, they, they breeze through it. Would you like to hear excerpts of the winners played on the Audi Awards themselves? Uh, this week, like I said, Audi topics, and you can always answer last week's question as well about your first time listening to an audiobook or a first memorable experience. And any answer that comes in will be entered into a drawing to win six promo codes to get you six audiobooks from Audible could use those to get anything, including the five Audi winners that I promised that we are going to talk about right now. And without no more delay from me, we're going to talk about the five big Audi categories, at least for me. Uh, as I said, they only let the last three give acceptance speeches, but I think these other two sort of merit being included. The first category that we're going to talk about is the best multi-voice performance. This goes to an audiobook that is narrated by a full cast or at least two narrators. This one has three, and it is Small Great Things by Jody Picot, narrated by Audra McDonald, Cassandra Campbell, and Ari Flyakos for Penguin Random House Audio. And um, I have not read this yet or listened to it, whatever your terminology of choice may be. Um, there's a good chance that I will because um, a friend of mine recommended Pico to me last year. And I listened to a book of hers called Lone Wolf. And I thought it was really very good and very well done. And I was a, kind of turned into a fan and I haven't really listened to anything from her since then, but uh, it's it's on my list. And um, I'm a big fan of Cassandra Campbell as a narrator as well. I can't say that I've really experienced the other two very much, but uh, Cassandra is a favorite of mine. And so I think this is probably one that I am going to check out just based on the fact that it's an author that I actually came to uh, appreciate and I would like to listen to more of her work and this one is certainly uh, one of those that I plan to listen to maybe not just because it won the Audi but just in general but maybe it's a little bit of a higher priority now so anyway without further delay uh, I'm just going to play you an excerpt of Small Great Things by Jody Picot. The miracle happened on West 74th Street, in the home where Mama worked. It was a big brown stone encircled by a wrought iron fence, 
and overlooking either side of the ornate door were gargoyles, their granite faces carved from my nightmares. They terrified me, so I didn't mind the fact that we always entered through the less impressive side door, whose keys Mama kept on a ribbon in her purse. Mama had been working for Sam Hollowell and his family since before my sister and I were born. You may not have recognized his name, but you would have known him the minute he said hello. He had been the unmistakable voice in the mid-1960s who announced before every show, the following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. In 1976, when the miracle happened, he was the network's head of programming. The doorbell beneath those gargoyles was the famously pitched three-note chime everyone associates with NBC. Sometimes, when I came to work with my mother, I'd sneak outside and push the button and hum along. The reason we were with Mama that day was because it was a snow day. School was canceled, but we were too little to stay alone in our apartment while Mama went to work, which she did through snow and sleet and probably also earthquakes and Armageddon. She muttered, stuffing us into our snowsuits and boots, that it didn't matter if she had to cross a blizzard to do it, but God forbid Ms. Mina had to spread the peanut butter on her own sandwich bread. In fact, the only time I remember Mama taking time off work was 25 years later, when she had a double hip replacement, generously paid for by the Hollowells. She stayed home for a week, and even after that, when it didn't quite heal right, and she insisted on returning to work, Mina found tasks to do that kept her off her feet. But when I was little, during school vacations and bouts of fever and snow days like this one, Mama would take us with her on the B train downtown. Mr. Hollowell was away in California that week, which happened often, and which meant that Ms. Mina and Christina needed Mama even more. So did Rachel and I, but we were better at taking care of ourselves, I suppose, than Ms. Mina was. When we finally emerged at 72nd Street, the world was white. It was not just that Central Park was caught in a snow globe. The faces of the men and women shuddering through the storm to get to work looked nothing like mine or like my cousins or neighbors. I had not been into any Manhattan homes except for the Hollowells, so I didn't know how extraordinary it was for one family to live alone in this huge building. But I remember thinking it made no sense that Rachel and I had to put our snowsuits and boots into the tiny cramped closet in the kitchen when there were plenty of empty hooks and open spaces in the main entry, where Christina's and Ms. Mina's coats were hanging. Mama tucked away her coat, too, and her lucky scarf, the soft one that smelled like her, and that Rachel and I fought to wear around our house because it felt like petting a guinea pig or a bunny under your fingers. I waited for Mama to move through the dark rooms like Tinkerbell, alighting on a switch or a handle or a knob so that the sleeping beast of a house was gradually brought to life. You two be quiet, Mama told us, and I'll make you some of Ms. Mina's hot chocolate. The next category that we're going to discuss is the best narration by the author or authors, and this is a category that has some big names attached to it in the nominees. You have Mary Louise Parker, Amy Schumer, Carol Burnett, uh, Neil Gaiman, among others. Uh, So, like I said, this one is sort of, it it really favors people who have some sort of name for a couple different reasons that you can probably figure out on your own. But um, this year's winner is A Life in Parts, written and narrated by Brian Cranston from Simon & Schuster Audio. Brian Cranston, of course, is best known for playing Walter White on Breaking Bad. I was a big fan of his uh, performance as the dad on Malcolm in the Middle back in the day. He's also been in Seinfeld and uh, all over the place, really, working very hard. And This is his uh, autobiography, and he is the winner of the 2017 Audi Award for best narration by the author or authors. And so now here is an excerpt from A Life in Parts, written and narrated by Brian Cranston. Walter White. She stopped coughing. Maybe she'd fallen back asleep. Then suddenly vomit flooded her mouth. 
She grasped at the sheets. She was choking. I instinctively reached to turn her over. But I stopped myself. Why should I save her? This little junkie Jane was threatening to blackmail me, expose my enterprise to the police, destroy everything I had worked for, and wipe out the financial life preserver I was trying to leave my family, the only legacy I could leave them. She gurgled, searching for a gasp of air. Her eyes rolled back in her head. I felt a stab of guilt. God damn it, she's just a girl. Do something. But if I stepped in now, wasn't I just delaying the inevitable? Don't they all at some point end up dead? And poor dumb comatose Jesse, my partner, lying beside her. She's the one who got him on this shit in the first place. She'd kill them both, kill us all, if I stepped in now and played God. I told myself, just stay out of it. When he wakes, he'll discover this tragedy, this accident on his own. Yes, it's sad. All death is sad. But he'll get over it in time. He'll get past this like every other bad thing that has happened to us. That's what humans do. We heal. We move on. A few months from now, he'll barely remember her. He'll find another girlfriend. He'll be fine. Fuck it. We all have to move on. I'll just pretend I wasn't here. But I am here. And she's a human being. Oh, God, what have I become? And then, somehow, as she was fading, she wasn't herself anymore. I wasn't looking at Jane or Jesse's girlfriend or the actor Kristen Ritter. I was looking at Taylor, my daughter, my real daughter. I wasn't Walter White anymore. I was Brian Cranston. And I was seeing my daughter die. From the moment she was born in 1993... A bit premature, shy of seven pounds, impossibly beautiful. I felt an instant, radical, unconditional love that redefined love. And I had never allowed myself to imagine losing her. But now I was seeing it. Clearly, vividly. She was slipping away from me. She was dying. That was not the plan. When I do the homework for such a delicate scene, I don't make a plan. My goal when I prepare isn't to plot out each action and reaction, but to think, what are the possible emotional levels my character could experience? I break the scene down into moments or beats. By doing that work ahead of time, I leave a number of possibilities available to me. I stay open to the moment, susceptible to whatever comes. The homework doesn't guarantee anything. With luck, it gives you a shot at something real. It was a real fear that gripped me. My worst fear. A fear I hadn't fully expected to come to terms with. And my reaction is there, forever, at the end of the scene. I gasp, and my hand moves to my mouth in horror. When the director, Colin Buxey, said, Cut, I was weeping. Deep, racking sobs. I explained to the people on set what had happened, what I had seen. Michael Slovis, our cinematographer, embraced me. My castmates, too. I remember in particular Anna Gunn, who played my wife, Skylar. I hugged her. I must have held on for five minutes. Poor Anna. Anna knew. As an actor, she has a fragility at her core, and she often had a hard time shedding her character's emotions after shooting a difficult scene. That will happen in an actor's life, and it happened to me that day. It was the most harrowing scene I did on Breaking Bad, and really, ever. It may seem odd, it may seem even ghoulish, to stand in a room packed with people and lights and cameras and pretend I'm letting a girl choke to death. And then to see my daughter's face in lieu of that girl, and to call that work, to call that your job. But it's not odd to me. Actors are storytellers, and storytelling is the essential human art. It's how we understand who we are. I don't mean to make it sound high-flown. It's not. It's discipline and repetition and failure and perseverance and dumb luck and blind faith and devotion. It's showing up when you don't feel like it, when you're exhausted and you think you can't go on. Transcendent moments come when you've laid the groundwork and you're open to the moment. Now we move on to the three categories that were allowed acceptance speeches at the Audis. 
And the first one is Best Male Narrator of the Year. The winner of that award was Simon Vance for his narration of Alan Moore's Jerusalem, a title that was published by Recorded Books. And this is one that I have to confess that I don't really know a lot about beyond the research that I did for uh, this segment of the show. But I will say that looking at it, um, it's described as an epic novel. And if the running time is uh, to be believed, it certainly qualifies as epic in terms of length, clocking in at over 60 hours uh, long. And so I don't know if this is something that I would uh, ever really get around to reading because I have a hard time keeping focus for uh, 60 hours and I don't typically um, switch back and forth from book to book. So I kind of read one until I'm done. So this one might take a while. This would definitely be an epic task to try to achieve. But I will say that Simon Vance is, you know, a pretty great narrator. Um, you know, I think I think I saw a blog post once by Johnny Heller, who is also an audiobook narrator, where he basically said something like, Simon Vance gives out Audis uh, at Halloween to trick-or-treaters. He wins them so often. Um, that may be an exaggeration, as Johnny is prone to do in his blog, but Simon Vance is a very good narrator, a very accomplished narrator. Uh, he's in my collection quite a bit. Uh, I think he did the James Bond titles that I have. And um, so he's certainly someone. And he most definitely did the complete Sherlock Holmes uh, collection that is in my audiobook collection. So maybe I will add Jerusalem to the list after I listen to the excerpt that you are also about to hear on the Talking Audiobooks podcast. Here's Jerusalem, the winner of the 2017 Audio Award for Best Male Narrator of the Year. The play that he apparently had learned by heart, blood-curdling stuff that he hadn't really understood and was unable now to bring to mind, except the part of it, he thought, was about lightning. And there was another bit concerning sums and masonry. He'd either woken at this point or else could not now recollect the story's end. It wasn't like he placed a lot of stock in dreams, as others did, as his dad John had done, but more that they were often smashing entertainment that cost nothing, and there wasn't much he could say about that. Shaking the last few drops from off the end, he looked down in surprise at the great head of steam that brimmed above the pole, belatedly apprised of just how icy the October garret was. Pushing the now-warmed vessel back under the bedboards, he rose to his feet and made his creaking way across the attic, to an heirloom washstand by the far wall opposite the window. Bending to accommodate the sharp decline in headroom at the loft room's edges, Ern poured some cold water from his mam's jug, with a picture of a milkmaid on, into the rusty, rimmed enamel washbowl, splashing it with cupped hands on his face, ruffling his lips and blowing like a horse at the astringent bite of it. The brisk rinse turned his mutton chops from arid, fiery scrub to freshly watered ringlet fronds, dripping below his jutting ears. He rubbed his face dry with a linen towel, then for a while looked on its faint reflection that gazed from the shallow puddle in the bowl. Craggy and lean, with straggling wisps of pepper at the brow, he could see in its early comic lines the doleful cracks and seams of how Urn thought he might appear in later life, a scrawny tabby in a thunderstorm. He dressed, the fraying clothes chilled so that they felt damp when first he put them on, and then climbed from the attic to the lower reaches of his mother's house, clambering backward down pinched steps that were so steep that they required one's hands to mount or to descend, as with a ladder or a quarry face. He tried to creep across the landing past the doorway of his mum's room and downstairs before she heard him, but his luck was out. A cowering, curtain-twitching tenant, when the rent man called, his luck was always out. Ernest! His mum's voice, like a grand industrial engine that had fallen into disrepair, stopped Ern dead with one hand on the round knob of the top banister. He turned to face his mother through the open door that led into her bedroom, with its smell of shit and rosewater more sickly than the smell of shit alone. 
Still in a nightgown with her thing hair in pins, Mum stooped beside her nightstand emptying her own room's chamber pot in a zinc bucket, after which she would go on to make the rounds of both the nipper's room and his and Annie's quarters, emptying theirs as well and then later depositing the whole lot in the privy at the bottom of their yard. Ernest John Vernal was a man of thirty-two, a wiry man with a fierce temper whom you wouldn't seek as an opponent in a fight, with wife and children, with a trade where he was quietly respected. But he scuffed his boots against the varnished skirting like a boy beneath his mother's scornful, disappointed frown. "'Are you in work today? Cos I shall have to be along the pawn shop if you're not. That little girl won't feed herself, and your hand's like a sleeve board. She can't feed em, baby thirster and your John.' Ern bobbed his head and glanced away down to the worn flypaper-covered carpet covering the landing from its stairhead to his attic door. I've got work all this week up at St Paul's, but shan't be paid till Friday. If there's anything you've hocked, I'll get it back then when I've had me earnings. She looked to one side and shook her head dismissively, then went back to decanting the stale golden liquid noisily into her bucket. Feeling scolded, Ern hunched down the stairs into the peeling umber of the passageway, then left and threw a door into the cramped fug of the living room, where Annie had a fire lit in the grate. Crouching beside the baby's chair and trying to get her to take warmed-up cow's milk from a bottle meant for ginger ale that they'd adapted, Annie barely raised her head as Ern entered the room behind her. Only their lad John looked up from where he sat, making a pig's ear of his porridge by the hearth, acknowledging his father's presence without smiling. There's a fried bread doing in the kitchen you can have for breakfast, but I don't know what they'll be when you get home. Come on, just take a spot of milk to please you, ma'am. This last remark Anne had directed at their daughter, Thursa, who was still red-faced and roaring, turning with determination from the weathered rubber teat as Ern's wife tried to steer it in between the baby's yowling lips. It was a little after seven in the morning, so that the dark papered cuddle of the room was mostly still in shadow, with the burnished bronze glow from its fireplace turning young John's hair to smelted metal, gleaming on the baby's tear-tracked cheek and painting half his wife's drawn face with light like drip. If you will recall, I mentioned earlier that there was one moment at the Audis that I thought was more memorable than anything else. It's one of those things where most of the ceremony is going to fade into my memory, and I may pluck obscure notes from it from time to time. Maybe if I go back and watch it again later, uh, I will be able to recall certain other things. But there's one moment that I think stands out as something that I don't think that I will soon forget, and that is the acceptance speech that was given by the recipient of the 2017 Audi for Best Female Narrator of the Year. Uh, The winner was Tavia Gilbert, She won for narrating the novel Be Frank With Me by Julia Claiborne Johnson, and this is a publication of Harper Audio. And what sticks out about this to me is Tavia's acceptance speech. As I said, I don't think I've ever seen another person be so touched to win an award as she was to win this one. She was very clearly moved by the experience. She said she uh, had been nominated previously but hadn't won. And I think she said her mom said it would be a disappointment if she didn't win this time. And it was very uh, moving and very meaningful to her. And it's one of those things that just by watching her speech, you do get the sense that it may not be why these people record audiobooks. They may not be doing it so that they can win Audis or acclaim or, you know, fame or recognition. That may not be the motivation at all, but the fact that they are recognized for their work is very meaningful to them, as it would be for pretty much anybody, I think. Uh, You know, hey, if I ever got nominated for some kind of podcast award, I'm sure that I would be grateful. I don't think that's ever going to happen unless all the other podcasts on the internet sort of get canceled and they decide to do the podcast awards anyway. But I, you know, I do get it. I've been nominated and received awards before and some do carry a lot of weight with me and some are things that I do remember. And like I said, her speech was fantastic. She really was so happy and I I think 
pretty close to tears if if not in tears just moved by the whole experience and like i said it was the highlight of the show and so without further ado here's an excerpt from be frank with me narrated by tavia gilbert the 2017 audio winner for best female narrator of the year fascinating but listen frank gentlemen don't point although i guess it's all right to point at mountains mountains don't have feelings like people do you aren't supposed to point at people how else are your eyes supposed to find them not that way nobody likes to look up and see people pointing and staring yes that i know from first-hand experience have you ever been up there to play in the snow i asked Up there? No, I can see it from my school. Just before winter break, they truck snow in from there and spread it on the playground for our winter festival. It's more convenient that way. And to think I'd been surprised people had their drinking water delivered. That sounds like fun, I said. Back in Omaha, we have to get our snow the old-fashioned way. Falls on us out of the sky. Here, when the hills are on fire, the ash falls like that, like snow, or the mashed potato flakes they use in movies as a stand-in for falling snow. Last summer, there was a huge brush fire and no wind, so this giant mushroom cloud of smoke hung in one place on the horizon for a week. Like an atom bomb mushroom cloud? That sounds scary. Exactly like that, except it wasn't scary. It was in the valley. Frank said the valley as if it were a world away instead of a few freeway exits. Did you know that Einstein's one regret? You know Albert Einstein, don't you? Mr. E equals MC squared. Everybody knows him. They do? Not personally, since, you know, he's dead. Yes, as of April 18th, 1955, Einstein's regret was that he signed the letter a scientist named Leo Szilard wrote to Franklin Roosevelt in 1939, warning of the danger of the Nazis inventing a nuclear fission bomb, many linked to the secrets unlocked by Einstein's famous equation. That bomb would be capable of unimaginable carnage. Einstein, who was a pacifist, felt the letter Szilard wrote also linked him to the creation of the fabled Manhattan Project. That's the one where the scientists tried to invent more affordable apartments in New York City, right? I don't know what you're talking about. Frank sounded troubled by this, like a guy who hadn't noticed an open manhole at his feet until he'd fallen into it. When would I learn? Knock, knock. Keep talking. The Manhattan Project, which led to the American invention of the atom bomb, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. Did you know that the Enola Gay, the airplane that dropped the first atom bomb, was built in Omaha in 1945? I didn't know that, I said. So, Frank, you must love school. You know more than most grown-ups I've met. The other kids say I'm retarded. I thought they said you were crazy. They say that, too. They're probably mad because you're smart and make good grades. Kids are stupid like that. The teachers love you, though, right? I'll tell you what my mother says teachers don't love, Frank said, being corrected. Sheesh. You don't do that, do you? Only when teachers make factual errors. In the mirror, his shoulders hadn't tensed up, but he'd put his goggles over his eyes again. Winston Churchill failed the sixth grade, he added. Oh, yeah? Yes, Frank Lloyd Wright never finished high school, neither did Cagney or Gershwin or Ansel Adams or Irving Berlin. Charlie Chaplin and Noel Coward never even finished grade school. Is that true? My mother keeps a list in the drawer of her bedside table. You can go look at it sometime if you don't believe me. I believe you. I'm gonna go home now. You're the boss, I said, and crept off the highway at the next exit. Neither one of us said anything for the rest of the trip. The next time I stole a look at Frank in the mirror, he was sleeping like a baby, his goggles down around his neck and his face pressed against the window. When we pulled into the driveway, I could hear Mimi hammering away on the typewriter through an open window. Frank started awake when I turned off the engine and ran for the house like an electrified rabbit with a live greyhound at its heels. I found him crouched outside Mimi's bedroom door, rocking in a little chair, invisible to earthlings like me. Are you okay? I whispered. I just want to sit with her for a while. I got that. I would have given anything to sit with my own mother again for a while. That's fine. Just don't bother her while she's working, all right? He nodded, and I decided to trust him. I went to the kitchen and hot potatoed Mimi's cell phone out of my pocket and onto the counter so she would see and relieve me of it as soon as possible. 
Then I took the list of emergency contacts from another pocket and entered them into my phone so I'd never have to touch hers again, ever. After all that guilty business was taken care of, I sorted through the mail I'd picked up from the box as we came in, separating trashable junk from the bills. There was... Last, but most definitely not least, we have the Audi Award for Audiobook of the Year for 2017. And I have to tell you that I didn't fill out any Audi ballots this year, you know, like you would do for the Oscars, or I didn't make any predictions. But, and I know I have the benefit of hindsight, and it's real easy for me to say this after the ceremony is over and after I know which book won. But had I predicted winners beforehand, this one I think I probably would have gotten right. Because I think that this is the book that I would have predicted would win because of how big the subject matter is in the culture these days. I mean, it's one of those things where geographically there's not a lot of reason for me to know about this because it's not likely that it's coming to my area anytime soon but you know you can't escape it in popular culture it's in the news quite a bit and has been and the 2017 audio book of the year goes to Hamilton the Revolution Written by Lynn Manuel Miranda and Jeremy McCarter, narrated by Mariska Hargitay, Lynn Manuel Miranda and Jeremy McCarter, published by Hachette Audio. You know, Hamilton the Revolution, I have to say, you know, this is, you know, like I said, a big deal. And of course, there was some Hamilt- Hamilton related controversy uh, last year. Uh, involving, or maybe it was earlier this year, like all my days are running together, uh, involving the then vice president elect Mike Pence when he went to see the show. But this sort of this book sort of chronicles how it all came to be. And of course, Mariska Hargitay is well known for her role on Law and Order Special Victims Unit. And it was kind of funny because I don't remember who gave the speech, but they said, you know, if you guys would have told me they were talking about the Audi judges, and and they said, you know, if you guys would have told me in advance, I'd have worked a lot harder to get Lynn and Mariska here to uh, accept the award. I believe Jeremy McCarter was there and he did speak briefly, but the other two were not. But Hamilton, The Revolution is the 2017 Audi winner for Audiobook of the Year. And now here you get to hear an excerpt. Act 1. I am a stranger in this country. I have no property here, no connections. Alexander Hamilton, 1780. Chapter 1. On the origins of revolution, both national and musical, with reference to opening numbers and White House raps. Lynn could see President Obama, but President Obama couldn't see Lynn. Standing at the back of the East Room, the 29-year-old actor, rapper, writer, gazed at some of the most celebrated figures in American culture. James Earl Jones was there, and the musician Esperanza Spaulding, and the novelist Michael Chabon. Some of them had performed in the program that night, an evening of poetry, music, and the spoken word. Others were honored guests sitting around the tables that filled the White House's ceremonial ballroom. It was May 12, 2009, one of the first cultural events of the Obama administration and an early fulfillment of the new president's promise to celebrate America's artists. Lynn had been asked to close the program. That was an honor but it also meant that he had to wait all night to take the stage. Except for going on a tour a few years earlier, that night was his first experience of the White House, his first look at the East Room, where Abigail Adams had hung her laundry, where James Madison had held cabinet meetings, where Abraham Lincoln had lain in state. At last, he got his cue. He walked through the crowd, passed by the president, the first lady, and their daughters, 
and climbed to the stage. I'm thrilled the White House called me tonight, he said. He was also terrified. The event's producers had asked him to perform a song from his musical In the Heights, which was still running on Broadway and which reflected themes that the new administration wanted to celebrate. Family, the importance of home, the vibrancy of the Latino community. Lynn had a different idea. Instead of one of the well-tested songs that was drawing applause eight times a week in a show that had won four Tony Awards, he wanted to try something new, a song that he had never performed in public and hardly ever in private. Lynn gripped his mic and prepared the crowd for what they were about to hear. I'm actually working on a hip-hop album, a concept album, about the life of someone who embodies hip-hop, he said. Treasury Secretary... Alexander Hamilton. You can see what happened next on YouTube, where video of the performance has been viewed more than a million times. As Lynn began to rap, the First Lady took up his invitation to snap along. President Obama didn't snap. He watched, smiling. When the song ended, he was the first one on his feet. The ovation owed a lot to the showbiz virtues on display, the vibrant writing, Lynn's dynamic rapping, the skillful piano accompaniment from his friend Alex Lacamoire. But something else was in the air, something that would become clearer in the years to come. Sometimes the right person tells the right story at the right moment, and through a combination of luck and design, a creative expression gains new force. Spark, tinder, breeze. That night, Lynn reintroduced people to the poor kid from the Caribbean who made the country rich and strong, an immigrant who came here to build a life for himself and ended up helping to build the nation. He is the prototype for millions of men and women who followed him and continue to arrive today. You can look up facts and figures that demonstrate the vast and growing importance of immigrants to our national life. The 13% of the population is foreign-born, which is near an all-time high, that one day soon, there will no longer be majority and minority races, only a vibrant mix of colors. Or, you could just look around the East Room that night and listen to the performance and consider what made it possible. In 1959, a young man came to the United States from Kenya. He fell in love with a Kansas girl and fathered a son who grew up to fulfill the American promise that any kid however unlikely, can be president. In 1973, another young man came here from Puerto Rico. He learned English, started a family, and one night in 2009, watched his son receive a standing ovation from the president of the United States. In 1967, yet another young man came here with a fierce gift for rhythm... This is Casey Trowbridge with the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Sale Alert. The folks over at ChristianAudio.com, that's Christian Audio, all one word, dot com, have unveiled their twice yearly sale. Nearly every book in their catalog is on sale for just $7.49 or less. That's right, I said nearly every book in their catalog. ChristianAudio.com specializes in inspirational faith-based fiction and nonfiction titles. While the site does offer several membership plans, this sale is available to everyone regardless of current membership status. ChristianAudio.com's $7.49 sale runs from now through June 23rd, so make your list and stock up. ChristianAudio.com also offers a free audiobook download each month. You can access this title at ChristianAudio.com slash free. All they ask is that you sign up for their newsletter, which makes you aware of new releases and sales alerts like this one. So check out the sale at ChristianAudio.com and check out the free audiobook download at ChristianAudio.com slash free and happy shopping.
And there you have it. The 2017 Audis are all wrapped up and we've covered some of the major winners. Uh, we want to send out congratulations to all of the winners, even if we didn't discuss them here on the show. Uh, we want to also congratulate all of the nominees for this year's Audi Awards. Being nominated and, of course, winning are both big achievements. And so we want to congratulate all that were involved in the Audi ceremony and the Audi Award nominees. And with that, you also heard a sale promotion for the website christianaudio.com. They have a sale going on this month. But what I wanted to mention about that now is this. We do not get paid for delivering a spot like that. When you hear an ad in the show like that for a company that is uh, having a sale, uh, that is something that we do for you, the listeners, as a public service. We want to get you aware of how to get audiobooks at a great deal, wherever that great deal might come from. So we are going to feature sales from other uh, distributors when they come up, like audiobooks.com, downpour.com, audible.com, and others. And so we are not being compensated for doing that. If the day should ever come that that happens and we are being compensated, we will be sure to let you know for the sake of transparency. But if you go to Christian Audio and spend a bunch of money and tell them, hey, the Talking Audiobooks podcast sent me, we'd be glad if you did that, but it's not going to generate us any more money. We don't have any affiliate deals with any of these distributors at the moment. So you're not really helping us out by buying from any of them, but you are helping yourself get audiobooks at a discount. And that's one of the aims of this program is to help people uh, spend as much money as they can to get as many audiobooks as they can without breaking the bank. So that's why we will be producing these sales spots and getting them out to you. And the other thing that I would say about that is if you happen to be a distributor or a publisher of audiobooks and you want to know why we're not talking about your sale or about your releases or what have you, the easiest way to rectify that would be to email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. And that way myself and producer Ken will see the email and see the information. And either he or I or the both of us can do a promo Uh, featuring your sale or we can feature your new releases on the news portion of this program but the truth is I try to find as much information as I can and I browse different sites looking for articles and news and I'm on social media a lot but it is just me doing this Ken is busy with other tasks and the truth is I very easily miss things and so Uh, the best way to ensure that we see it would be to email feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. And if it's a sale, we would appreciate it if you gave us a week heads up so that we could record a promo and have it in the next show timed in conjunction for when your sale is going on. That's especially true if it's a weekend sale. If it doesn't last for more than a couple days if you send it to us the day it begins we're not going to be able to get a promo recorded and uh, mixed and stuff in time to get it out by the time your sale ends so uh, emailing us that information in advance so we can get something recorded and into the show so that it's timed to coincide with your sale would be something that would benefit you and I because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to benefit the industry and we're trying to cover as many bases as we can and we know we can't be everything to everyone and we know that we're going to miss out on some things and we know that uh, you know not everybody is going to like what we're doing necessarily or think that we could be doing more or whatever it might be but we're going to try to do what we can for the good of the industry and for the good of promoting audiobooks to the biggest possible audience that we can and so if you want to help us out by getting us your news items or your sale announcements feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com is the place to go 
Now, having said that, I wanna drop a couple of other news items here real quick. The first is relating to ChristianAudio.com, as a matter of fact, and that is that their new app is available for the Android devices. Um, I just got the email about that this morning saying that their app was now on Android devices. Previously, it had been available for the iOS devices, but they have finally acceded to popular demand and it is now on Android as well. So you can download that and you can access your ChristianAudio.com library of content on your Android device. And that's always good news when audiobook uh, distributors and publishers get their apps out to as many places as they can. I would like to see more apps on the Apple TV myself as I'm an Apple TV owner. But, um, you know, I like to listen through my big sound bar and speakers, so uh, that would be cool. But like I said, it's always good to have it on a new source. And so the Christian Audio app is now available for Android devices. Moving to a sister company to ChristianAudio.com. These companies both fall under RB Media, which also has recorded books and Highbridge and Tantor Audio and several other different companies. But um, audiobooks.com is celebrating June as Audiobook Month with a bunch of things that they have going on. And I would encourage you to head over to audiobooks.com slash audiobook month to see everything that they are doing this month. They have free uh, book downloads or you can add books to their library. They release a new one each Thursday and it's available for 24 hours. So the, by the time you've heard this, you've missed out on two of them. I missed out on the first one. That's just how busy I've been. But, um, you know, they have the free book every Thursday. They also have uh, sales and two books for one credit if you happen to be a member. I don't believe that the uh, the free books are something you have to be a member to get. I think those are free for anyone. You just need an account so that you can add them to your library. And aside from that, they also have a big monthly giveaway going on on their Facebook page, facebook.com slash audiobooks.com. That's all one word, audiobooks and then com. No underscores or dashes or anything in that. And you can enter that daily to win a bunch of great prizes, including a 32 gigabyte iPad, a wireless headphones, uh, gift subscriptions to audiobooks.com, and a lot more. And you can mo- enter that multiple times daily. You get bonus entries if people you refer uh, enter the giveaway as well. So I would encourage you to find all of that information at audiobooks.com slash audiobookmonth, all one word. There's no dashes or uh, underscores or anything like that in there. And the final bit of news I have is just a reminder to check out audiobooksync.com. That's audiobook, S-Y-N-C, dot com. Uh, As you listen to this, it's week seven of their Summer of Sync program to uh, distribute free audiobooks for teenagers and young adults to keep them reading during the summer months when they are not in school. Uh, They're seven weeks in. They're close to, if not at, the halfway point of this particular program for the summer. And so you have plenty of chances to get some free books for yourself or someone in your family. You'll need the OverDrive Media Console app, which is available for Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, and so on. If you listen to audiobooks from your library, the chances are pretty good that you already have the OverDrive Media Console app installed. A lot of libraries use that for distribution. And so again, I want you to Head over to audiobooksync.com. You can grab a couple free books this week. They go up on Thursday, so uh, the week seven titles would have gone up yesterday when you're listening to this, and they will be up through the end of Wednesday and uh, next Thursday. That will start week eight. You just need to provide a name and an email address, and you can uh, 
download them each and every week throughout the summer. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. We now move to what caught my ear this week, and this is the segment where I browse the coming soon section or the recent releases section of various audiobook websites to see what catches my ear, what grabs my attention. As I said last week, these aren't books that I have listened to already. There are things that if I mention them on the show, this is my way of saying this is something that I'm going to listen to. So it's not an endorsement per se. Um, It's just me telling you that, yes, I intend to listen to this, and it caught my ear, and I wanted to share it with you. And as I was browsing uh, through those various sections to do this week's uh, What Caught My Ear, at first I wasn't sure what I was going to find, if I would find anything that really jumped out at me as being something that caught my ear, and that was a recent release Uh, The book I chose came out on June 6th, so the same week as you're hearing this, it was released. And at first, like I said, I browsed a few of my usual genres, and I didn't really see anything that was getting my attention. But I headed over to the science and technology genre on Audible and was looking through the list, and I came across my... Uh, title for this week. My What caught my ear for this week is Vacation Guide to the Solar System, Science for the Savvy Space Traveler by Olivia Kosky and Jana Gersovich, narrated by Kathleen McInerney with Olivia Kosky and Jana Gersovich. This is a publication of Penguin Audio. It is five hours and 53 minutes long. And as I mentioned before, it was released on June 6th of 2017. And I'm not going to read the publisher's summary per se. We'll have a link to where you can get this book if it interests you in the show notes. But I will tell you that I like the idea behind this book, as you can tell from the title, what it's probably going to be about. The author's take... Uh, You on a tour of the solar system as if you were going to be traveling to these destinations like Mars or the moon Titan or Venus or what have you. And they tell you what you would need to get there and what you could expect to happen while you were there before your death um, from the elements or what have you. Uh, In the case of Venus, your trip there would be uh, memorable, but uh, your time would be short. And I like this idea for a couple different reasons. I'm a big fan of astronomy, and I'm all about our solar system. I'm fascinated by the planets and moons, and um, I think this concept allows people to understand our solar system better in an accessible way, in a relatable way. People uh, can relate to the idea of traveling to places and taking vacations. And it's timed perfectly due to the fact that it is the summer months in the United States and people tend to take their vacations in summer. And maybe you're tired of visiting Disneyland and, you know, you're not quite convinced that Mount Rushmore is the place for you. It is, um, I should point out, you know, to advertise my home state, Mount Rushmore, wonderful place. But once you've seen it, I will admit that you've seen it once, you've seen it enough. Um, You know, maybe you want to travel to a place that's a little less populated, a little less popular, a little more off the beaten path. Well, then maybe Mars is your 
uh, vacation destination of choice. And Vacation Guide to the Solar System will tell you all about how to uh, get there and what things will be like for you when you're there and all the different things you'll need. Like I said, just a neat little idea. It's not a terribly long book. Seems like it would be a lot of fun. I haven't listened to it yet, but I will. And uh, I may have comments on it in the future. But right now, that's what caught my ear. And as I'm saying that, I'm going to throw to an excerpt so you can see if Vacation Guide to the Solar System, Science for the Savvy uh, Space Traveler, is a book that you might be interested. So here now is an excerpt from Penguin Audio's Vacation Guide to the Solar System. Your journey to the moon begins at a spaceport. Spaceports are just like airports. In most cases, you'll depart from a launch pad rather than a runway. They tend to be in the desert or near bodies of water, just in case a rocket explodes or crashes at takeoff. You can take a pre-holiday outing near your launch site before you depart, since spaceports are built in areas known for clear skies and calm weather. These may be your last memories of Earth. Breaking the bond of Earth's gravity will require you to attain the great speed of 25,020 miles per hour, known as Earth's escape velocity. To achieve this speed, you will be strapped to a, hopefully, controlled explosion. A single launch from Earth takes almost half the energy that a flight all the way to the edge of the solar system requires. This is the origin of the old spacefarer's saying, half the journey is getting to orbit. You'll save money by choosing flights that depart near the equator. Taking off from there on an eastward launch gives your rocket a kick from the spin of the Earth. Jet engines are great for taking you from one side of the Earth to the other, but they require something in short supply in space. Air, specifically the oxygen found in air. Chemical rocket fuel that powers many rocket ships provides its own oxygen to create thrust. For a short trip to the moon, you don't have to worry about fueling up along the way. If you're headed to more distant settings, the basic ingredients for chemical rocket fuel are available on many terrestrial worlds which means you don't have to pack all your fuel with you. The computers that brought the first visitors to the moon were much less powerful than your smartphone. The 240,000-mile journey takes three days, but if you're just passing by without stopping, you can get there in as little as nine hours. It's hard to get lost on your way to the moon, since you can see it from Earth and it's a simple matter of keeping your ship pointed in the right direction. En route, watch out for the Van Allen radiation belts, which are zones of trapped particles. They can wreak havoc on electronics, though they appear to cause little harm to humans. There are two main sections. One is 400 to 6,000 miles above Earth's surface, while the other is between 8,400 and 36,000 miles from it. Apollo mission scientists were initially concerned they might cause health problems for astronauts, but onboard radiation detectors showed that radiation remained at safe levels during the crossing. You might want to see which of your travel companions can hold their breath the longest as you sail through. Once you've reached orbit around the moon, take part in the traditional celebration of cracking a bottle of champagne. Just be careful, as opening a bottle can be a dangerous endeavor in the low-pressure environment of your spaceship. Watch out for the cork as it shoots out of the bottle at speed, as well as the inevitable floating blobs of bubbly. <laughs> And there you heard an excerpt from my What Caught My Ear title this week, a Vacation Guide to the Solar System. 
Uh, like I said, this one seemed like a lot of fun to me. It's one I will definitely be listening to. Probably will have completed by the time you've heard this show, actually. But uh, if this is something that interests you, let me know. Like I said, this is what caught my ear. I would love to know what's catching your ear. What are you listening to right now? Send me a note, drop me a line at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com and you will be entered into a giveaway and you could win perhaps as many as six Audible credits depending upon how we decide to dole them out, how many entries we get. It could be anywhere from one to six depending upon how many people enter. So get your comments in. Let me know what you're listening to. Let me know what pre-orders you're looking forward to. That's kind of the idea behind the what caught my ear segment you might not be interested in the same book i am but it's a good opportunity for me to ask you what book you are interested in listening to and now before we close the show we're going to hear from ken one more time he's going to tell us about how to play audio bingo and how you play audio bingo is important because that is going on this month with uh, it being audiobook month, of course, all June long. That's how these things tend to work. And so Ken is going to tell you how to play audio bingo. And I am going to be back to tell you about how I'm doing in audio bingo. And then I'm going to wrap it up for this week. So let's throw to the producer, Ken, one more time. And he's going to explain the rules of audio bingo. <music> Hey, audio fans, this is producer Ken, inviting you to join Jess and Tina's super fun audiobook challenge. Jess from the audiobookworm.com and Tina from astoldbytina.net have put their heads together and come up with a unique way to celebrate the fact that June is audiobook month. The object is to get three in a row or fill out all nine squares on your audio bingo card. A printable version of the card can be found at theaudiobookworm.com. The nine spaces to fill in are as follows. One, listen to an audiobook narrated by the author. Two, listen to an audiobook recommended by a friend. Three, listen to an audiobook that has been on your TBR or to be read list. I guess this should be TBL for to be listened list. Anyway, listen to an audiobook that's been on your list for more than a year. Number four, listen to an audiobook that was released within the last month. Number five, free space. Number six, listen to an audiobook that was released during your birth month. Number seven, listen to an audiobook with a narrator that has the same first initial as you. Number eight, listen to an audiobook narrated by a famous actor. Number nine, re listen to your favorite audiobook. The officially recognized hashtag for this event is hashtag audio bingo. This is a challenge after all, so why not spark a competition among your friends and family? It's a great way to get them to listen to audiobooks, maybe even for the first time. It's also a good opportunity to get to know your fellow listeners via social media. The Talking Audiobooks podcast's very own Casey Trowbridge is participating, and he'll be discussing his progress in future episodes. The challenge is going to be active for the entire month of June, so start listening and have fun! And now that you've heard the rules for audio bingo, let me give you an update on my progress. I'm recording this on June the 3rd, which means the month is, you know, fairly young. Got lots of time left to mark off all nine squares on the card, but already I have marked off two of them. The question for me right now is which two have I marked off? And uh, that's a little unclear because one of the books that I listened to, I could really use on multiple squares on the on the card, and it's just going to be a matter of picking which one it's going to fill. The one that I have definitely filled is I have listened to a book narrated by a famous actor, and I went with The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, uh, narrated by... Nick Offerman, of course, it was written by Mark Twain. This is an Audible Studios production. It came out last September. Um, If you buy the Tom Sawyer Kindle book for the low, low price of zero dollars and zero cents, you can get the narrated 
version by Nick Offerman for a cool $1.99, which is very reasonable. Um, Tom Sawyer has always been one of my favorite books. Uh, certainly was when I was a kid. Um, I listened to a version a couple years ago narrated by Dick Hill, who many of you would be familiar with. He's a very prominent narrator as well, and I can listen to him narrate this book, but I had the Offerman version. Uh, I picked it up for $1.99, and uh, it's been in my library for a while, and since I always enjoy listening to Tom Sawyer again, this was an easy choice to fill my first bingo slot. Now the second one is a little bit harder. This is the one where I could use it to fill multiple spots. Uh, It is Chuck Klosterman 10, an audio companion to his uh, book. It's not a book per se. It's more like an audio commentary to be listened to as you read his book. Uh, He explains on the audio track why he did it this way. And it's sort of an interesting concept. Uh, It's about three hours long. If you listen at normal speed, I listened at 2x speed, so I finished it in half the time. Uh, It was an interesting idea. Um, And the reason it fills multiple spots for me and I have to decide which one I'm going to use it on is the fact that uh, it's narrated by the author. That's one square I could check with it. It's narrated by a person who has the same first initial that I do. Casey starts with a C in this case, and so does Chuck, as in Chuck Klosterman. And it was also released within the last month. It came out on May 16th, 2017. So, uh, like I said, I could use it to fill any number of bingo slots, which ones kind of depend on um, other ones for the future. As I record this on June 3rd, those are the only two slots that I've filled. Um, I have a couple others that I planned to listen to, as I said, one of which is uh, the Caught My Ear title. And by the time you've heard this, I probably will have listened to that book. And that will cross off a third um, slot. And last week's Caught My Ear title, The Guardians of the Galaxy Collect Them All, is one I will hopefully have listened to by the time you hear this. And that could cross off yet another spot on the card for me as well. The fact that the authors participate in the narration of the vacation guide to the solar system means that I could use it to fill that slot, although there is a third narrator involved, so we we might need a judge's ruling on that, but uh, regardless, it could also fill my free space or it could fill my listen to in the last, or released in the last month um, category. And there's a few more that I plan to uh, listen to, and there's a couple that vex me. Uh, The one that I'm going to have the most trouble with is uh, listen to a book recommended by a friend. So if you're out there and you have a book recommendation, feel free to send it to feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. And if I pick it, if I pick it, I will listen to it and fill in a space because I will consider you a friend for having recommended a book to me and you will also be entered into our drawing as I've mentioned countless times since taking over this hosting job I'm sure I'm going to get like uh, feedback repeats himself often yeah I know right because sometimes I do that I call it reinforcing important things but other people might use a a less technical term and say repeats himself too often so i'm trying to get stuff drilled into your head but you might call it repetitive i guess it depends on the person i certainly have said the phrase i've said this before or i mentioned it earlier or something to that effect quite a number of times on this show and 
I promise to vary up my phrasing a little bit better in the future and not repeat myself, but sometimes it happens because I record these segments out of order and I have to remember what I said and make sure that I have said something uh, in a segment that I said that I was going to say later, you know, like I realized that sentence was just really weird, but like if I refer to something in a segment that I haven't actually recorded yet, I need to make sure that I actually do what I say I'm going to do and talk about what I said I talked about already, even though you're hearing it afterwards. So if your mind is now broken, I think that means I've done my job for the week and we can end this episode of Talking Audiobooks. Like I said, I got a lot of excerpts this week. Let me know if that's what you like. Let me know if you tell me less of you talking, more book excerpts, I promise I won't be offended. Um, like I said, and there it is again. I want to make the show for the listeners. And to do that, I need to hear from you. And so if you like more book excerpts and less of me talking about books, you know, that's certainly something that I can do. The less I have to hear myself talk, the better. And if I can get out of doing work by playing book excerpts, more than happy to do it and just come up with a theme, maybe to tie them all together. Uh, You know, this really should be a show for you, the listeners, not for me, the host. I'll have fun either way and I'll get my reward either way, but I want to make it for you guys. So let me know what you like. Let me know what you don't like and be gentle. Uh... I'll only say that I'm repeating myself once in your email, please. Because otherwise, then you'll be repeating yourself. And you don't want to do the same thing you're going to uh, condemn me for doing. With that having all been said, and headaches having been induced, and updates having been given, I hope you enjoyed our Audis recap show for this uh, week. Uh, we'll have a more organized audience presentation, hopefully, when the 2018 nominees are announced. And maybe we can actually read some plot summaries for these books. Uh, I apologize again. Uh, technology makes it difficult for me with a visual impairment to read that stuff. Uh, we're working on making some upgrades around the talking audiobook studios that will help in that endeavor and maybe if that doesn't work maybe i can grab a co-host to come on and read some plot summaries so you don't have to look at them in the show notes find the links to the books in the show notes but anyway i'm really bad at saying goodbyes it's been a like a horrible trait for mine for years um I spent hours on the phone trying to say goodbye at times. So uh, with that having all been said again and again and again, this is Casey Trowbridge for the Talking Audiobooks podcast. Until next week, keep listening. So I have an Audis story to tell, and I teased it on Twitter just a few minutes, maybe an hour before I started recording this, I said I had an Audis story to tell that I really wanted to share, but you have to listen to the 6-9 podcast to get the uh, full story, because I'm nothing if I'm not willing to promote myself. And so here is my Audis story. It's Thursday night. I'm watching the ceremony. Ceremony runs from 7 to 9 p.m. Central in South Dakota. So I'm watching it and I'm live tweeting thoughts and just having random conversations with people who were also following the live stream or just following the results. And I... You know, it was worthwhile for me to do that because I was able to engage a few people in conversation and I picked up a few new followers along the way. So uh, live tweeting that and, and sort of being a part of that on social media was a lot of fun. So I'm very busy and I'm not checking my Facebook and I'm not 
uh, doing much of anything else social media wise aside from uh, just tweeting about the Audis. So I don't know what I'm about to tell you until later. And so ceremony's over and I'm still kind of, um, I'm done tweeting about it, but I have to uh, get Ken the list of excerpts that I wanted to use for this week's show that you'll hear later on when we discuss the five big winners and and um, I wanted to get that list to him, so I was putting it together and sort of gathering up thoughts for the show. And so I'm still not on Facebook, and I'm really distracted. And, and then I, I go to bed, and Friday is a really hectic day. Friday last week, of course, my first episode as host, as solo host, has dropped, and at least it was supposed to drop. It didn't uh, right away. It was supposed to drop at 9 a.m. Eastern, but uh, Ken was very busy last week and he didn't get it uploaded until late Friday evening. So I'm wired because I'm waiting for the show to drop and I'm just, I'm amped. I want to know what people think. I am, you know, just kind of high strung and and curious and I had a meeting in the morning and uh, you know was still not on social media really other than my own Facebook wall just to maintain that I checked in uh, to some place Friday morning but you know I wasn't looking at my news feed that's kind of the point of this and I really didn't look at my news feed all of Friday you know, I was kind of doomed by not looking at my newsfeed. I'd have seen this news a lot sooner if I had, but I just didn't get to it. And when the show published, I was busy, you know, updating various social media accounts, talking about the fact that the show was out and what was in it. And, you know, then I went and actually listened to uh, the show where I skimmed through it just to hear some of the stuff that Ken did in post-production. And then I went and grabbed the pizza because I was in a celebratory mood and I didn't want to cook. The show was finally out and I could sort of bask in the glory of my quote unquote achievement. So I'm still not checking my Facebook news feed. So it's late Friday night, maybe even very, maybe even very early Saturday morning. And I'm finally checking my news feed on my iPad and uh, I'm scrolling through posts and I see one from my cousin Trevor and my cousin Trevor is congratulating our cousin Josh and his wife Christine on the birth of their son and of course I knew that they were expecting a child and that the due date was very close and that you know it could really happen at any time I just hadn't heard because I wasn't checking my newsfeed well, I, what I came to discover was that their son was actually born on Thursday. And I texted Josh's sister, my cousin Shiloh, and I said, when was he born? And she said, Thursday night at 8.33. So I'm thinking, okay, he's was born while I'm watching the Audis and while I'm you know, doing that and preparing for this episode. So I thought, well, that's interesting. But here's the topper. My cousin Josh and his wife, Christine, named their son, their nine pound, six ounce baby boy, my new first cousin once removed, Audie Hayes Christensen. A-U-D-I-E the exact same spelling of the Audi Awards that I was watching when he was born. So I have them to thank for helping me fill about five minutes of this podcast. So that is my big Audi story that I teased on Twitter. I hope you enjoyed that. It's a massive coincidence. I'm 
pretty confident that my cousin and his wife do not know about the Audi Awards. I'm pretty sure that they're not audiobook listeners, or if they are, we've never really discussed it. But um, it just, it's one of those interesting sort of coincidences that happens in life from time to time. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it on that. Talking Audiobooks is a trademark of KenJoy Media, produced by KenJoy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Your host has been Casey Trowbridge, produced by KenJoy, theme music composed by Christian Anderson, licensed through EpidemicMusic.com. Visit our website at TalkingAudiobooks.com, follow us on Twitter at Talking Audio, follow us on Facebook at Talking Audiobooks, and subscribe to the Talking Audiobooks YouTube channel. Here's a disclaimer. Various sponsors, like Audible.com, help make this podcast possible. However, they are not responsible for its content, they don't dictate what we talk about or what books we share with you, and therefore the opinions that you hear on here are unfortunately those of the host and our guests. We'd love to hear from you, so email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us what audiobooks you're listening to, what you've liked in the past, narrators that you like. Ask us questions, anything. It's for your feedback. Feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. That's it. See you next time on Talking Audiobooks.